open your Bibles this morning to John chapter 2. So second grade and below can go to Children's Church. As we look at this passage this morning, it's one that is familiar. It's in the beginning of the Gospel of John. It's at the end, the final week of Jesus' life in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, whether it is the same thing and John just reported it early on for a specific reason or whether it happened at two different times, we don't really know. One thing to remember, though, is we're going to look about Jesus talking about the temple being destroyed, and they misunderstood what he said, but this was written after the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. So as John wrote this, he's reporting the events that took place in Jesus' life, maybe chronologically, maybe just placing them in a certain order, but they were whatever way it was, it is the way God told him to do it. Now, as we look at it, we're going to see money changers and all that taking place in the temple. And what I want us to look at today is what is the purpose of the Father's house? Now, the passage is going to be talking about the temple. But we don't go to the temple to worship. We come to the church house to worship. So instead of thinking about what was God's purpose for the temple, let's think about what's God's purpose for Brown Road Baptist Church, the people that meet in this building. See, this building is not Brown Road Baptist Church. It's where Brown Road Baptist Church meets at. We are the church, not the building. The building is only material that is put there. But we are the church. What's God's purpose for us as we come together, as we meet together? And what are we to do? And we can find, as we look at this passage, much of what God wants us to do. We'll find even what we should not be doing as we look at it. So stand with me as I read and follow along, hopefully in your Bible. And sometimes people ask, what translation do I use? I use New King James. That's what's on the screen. That's what is in the Pew Bibles. So follow along, beginning in verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered, that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you give us, give to us, since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, <coughs> Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken forty six years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they remembered the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Father, as we come to you today, we give you all honor and glory for everything that you do. Help us to understand the purpose of your house, the purpose of being here, 
of the things that we do, things we shouldn't be doing, and things that we should be doing in your house. Things that will bring honor and glory to you, things that will enable the church to grow and you to be glorified through that growth. And Lord God, that we will take heed to what you have to say. And those who are here who have not repented of their sins and accepted Jesus will come and do that today, that those who have maybe already accepted you but not followed you in believer's baptism will do that, others to join the church or rededicate their lives. But whatever the Holy Spirit leads us to do that we will do this morning and do it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. When we think about the purpose of God's house or the Father's house, and we bring it down to today to the church, you can get a very wide variety of things. I think, personally, in most places it's a meeting house for people that profess to be Christians to come together and just be friendly with each other, sing some songs, listen to a sermon, give some money, and go home and feel good about doing their religious duty for the week. But I don't think that is the purpose of the God's house or the Father's house. I think the purpose goes a whole lot deeper than that. Now, when we look at this passage, and we see the money changers and the people that were selling livestock in the temple, and Jesus ran them out. Now, there is a purpose for running them out. But let me show you something. Their being there was not wrong. It is how they were doing it and where they were doing it at that Jesus got upset about. Go turn back in your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 14. Deuteronomy chapter 14. As we look at this, now remember the temple had not been built at this time. The temple was way off from here. So he's talking about where God leads the people to offer their sacrifices to him. Beginning in verse 22, you shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Now listen. But if the journey is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry the tithe, or if the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, when the Lord your God has blessed you, then you shall exchange it for money. Take the money in your hand and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses, the place that they're to offer the sacrifices, And you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep, for wine or similar drink, for whatever your heart desires, you shall eat there before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. You shall not forsake the Levite who is within your gates, for he is no part of nor inheritance with you. So what's God saying? God is saying, when I tell you 
that you're to come to a certain place and you're to bring your tithe, you're to bring the firstborn of your flocks, and you're to offer them there as a sacrifice. If it is too far for you to travel to bring your flocks, then bring money. And at the place that I tell you to bring your sacrifice, there you may buy a bull, a lamb, a dove, whatever it is that you need to offer as a sacrifice to God. Now by this time, there was also a temple tax. And the people, this was Passover. And all Jewish males had to come to Jerusalem, to the temple, to offer their sacrifices for Passover. The temple tax had to be paid in the local currency. But they were coming from different countries, different currencies. They had to exchange their currencies into the local currency in order to pay the temple tax before they could enter into the temple. So what I'm saying is God had already set up a system that they were able to buy what they needed before they went into the temple to offer it to God. Now, the problem here was that they were cheating the people. Two problems. They were cheating the people. They were charging too much. They were robbing the people, charging too much for the animals because they were between a rock and a hard place. They had to make a sacrifice, but they had nothing to sacrifice, so they had to buy it. And the money changers were cheating the people as well, not giving them as much as they should get in exchange for the people. That's the first problem. The second problem that they ran into here is that it had become such a big business that it had moved into the court of the Gentiles. Now the court of the Gentiles was a place where Gentiles could enter into the temple. They couldn't go any further than the court of the Gentiles, but it was a place where they could interact with the Jews. And the Jews could show them that God was the only God and that they were to worship God and try to win them over to their faith. But they were unable to do that because the business had grown so much and they were making so much money that they expanded. And they expanded into areas that they were not supposed to be in. But the mere fact that they were able to buy and sell was set up by God as the, even before the temple was built that they were to go to where God told them to do, and if they couldn't bring it, then bring money and buy there what they needed so that they could give God the sacrifice that they were supposed to do. Now, as we think about it, and we think about the church today, let's look at the negative first. Because that was a big negative. They were doing things inside the temple proper that they were not supposed to be doing. Now we can talk about Jesus getting mad and getting upset, but what we've got to understand, it was about the Father's house and the misuse of the Father's house. I wonder today if he would walk into most church and get upset about what's going on in most churches. We may not have an open air market, but are we doing the things that we're supposed to do? 
You see, a lot of times in a lot of churches, they're battlegrounds. The people are not of one mind and one accord. Their goal is not to honor God and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Their goal is to get their way. Maybe to be recognized and adored for who they are or what they do. And when we go into churches, we find many times a cold formalism instead of of a worship and praise of Almighty God. There are churches that you can go to and you get to the door and open the door and it's just like an ice blast that are coming, that's coming out. Because it's cold, it's dead inside that church. I don't think the Lord Jesus Christ is pleased at all with churches that do that. Now, how can, how can I say that the majority of churches would fit into this category? Because the majority of churches are either plateaued or declined. And if they're plateaued, they're more than likely going to be declining pretty soon. Because it's very, very hard for a church that is plateaued are declining to turn around and become a growing, vibrant church again. And let me say this, Brown Road Baptist Church, we ought to be on our knees thanking Almighty God that He intervened and He turned this around. Because there was a time not many years ago that this church was on its last legs. And we can talk about who did this and who did that, but let me tell you something. It was Almighty God that did it. And He only did it through people that were willing to let Him work and do it. But this is a very, very rare exception. Most churches are dying today. And they're probably not going to turn around. The big thing today is two dying churches join together and try and make one vibrant church. Problem is, there's got to be a change. And you can't make that change if you want to keep doing everything the way that we've done it in the past. Because the way it was done in the past is the way that got you into that situation to begin with. And it's only going to take you back there when we keep saying, like we did in the past, like we did in the past. When Jesus walked into the temple and He saw these things happening in the temple, and He made the whip and He ran them out. Now notice, He didn't destroy anything that they had. He ran the animals out. He overturned the tables. They could have picked up the money. He didn't kill any of the animals. He did not let the birds out of the cages and say, fly away, bird. He told the merchants, take your cages and get them out of here. He wasn't destructive in what he did, but he was saying, and Matthew Mark. Mark and Luke say that he says, because this is a house of prayer. (coughs) This is a house that God is to be honored and glorified in. So I want us to look at three different things that we can learn from this about the purpose of the Father's house. First thing is that it is a house of prayer. That it is a place that we come to pray in. Now, we have prayer. I pray. A deacon prays. I pray after I read the message. And I pray at the end of the sermon. So we have prayer. 
But in a couple of weeks after I talk with the deacons, our prayer time, I hope, is going to change. Our prayer time is not going to be me standing up here saying, the altar is open if you'd like to come to the altar and pray. Pray, otherwise stay where you're at. It will be if you want to be prayed for. We are going to have deacons up here that are going to stand and pray for you. And if you request it, they will anoint you with oil. And pray for you. Why? Because this is a house of prayer. And we think and say, well, why don't we always do that? Why haven't we done that in the past? You know why I think we don't do things like that? I think we're afraid. What if God doesn't do something? What if we pray and they don't get better? You know why? You know what? then it wasn't God's will. We will pray for healing, but we will also pray for God's will to be done. Well, what if we pray and they die? I don't want to sound bad, but if they're a Christian, hallelujah. Because they're finally where they've always wanted to be, with God in heaven. It's a house of prayer. And we ought not to be afraid. Well, if, if we pray and we got deacons up here and people come and say, I'm sick, will you pray for me? Or I, my daughter, my son, my grandchild, my grandmommy, or whatever it is is sick, will you pray that God will work in their lives, that they will be healed, and will you anoint me with oil? Well, what if somebody comes in and says they're a bunch of Pentecostals? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Listen to me. Doing what God has told us to do is not Baptist, it's not Pentecostal, it is biblical. And that's all there is to it. It is biblical. So we need to be a house of prayer. We need to be a church that is a praying church. And we've got opportunities. We've got a prayer room and a thing out there to sign up for one hour during the week so that you can go out there to the prayer room. We'll give you the combination to get in once you get signed up. And it's a secure place. No one else can get in while you're there, and you go in and you spend an hour in there praying. You say, well, I can't think of enough things to pray for for a whole hour. There is enough material in there and prayer requests that you will say, where did my hour go to? I'm not halfway through this yet. And then maybe you'll come back over and sign up for a second hour. But it's if you're not doing that, on your way out, sign up. Pick your hour during the week out. You don't have to come into the office. You don't have to do anything. You just go to the prayer room, punch, punch the code in the door lock, and go in and spend an hour in intercessory prayer for this church, for the members of this church. There's a prayer group on Tuesday night that you can come and be. And they got a prayer list that's that thick. Not quite that thick, but pretty thick. And they break up in groups of two and go to different rooms and pray for specific things during that time. And do you know another opportunity you have to pray? In your home every day moment of the day. You can pray anytime you want. Students, you can pray at school anytime you want. You don't have to stand in the middle of the hall and shout out your prayer. God hears it 
when you're saying it quietly to yourself. God knows. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He hears you. No one can stop you from saying a silent prayer. They don't even know you're doing it. But God does. This is a house of prayer. It's not a place of arguing and fighting. It's not a place of look at me. I'm important. I can do this. You can't. It is a place of people coming together to honor Almighty God. And one of the things that we're to do is to be a praying church. The second thing that we're to do is to bring our sacrifices to God. Now, there isn't an altar up here And there's not a holy of holies back here where a great high priest is going to take the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant and all the other things that are around. But you're to bring your sacrifices. Now I know we don't have pens out there for you to put your bulls and your calves in and your goats and your sheep. But you know, God has told us a couple of things, three or four things, four that I'm going to mention that are even more important than bringing a bull or a lamb or anything else to God. In Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 3, he said to do righteousness and justice is more important to God than a sacrifice. To do righteousness and justice is more important to God. To treat other people right, to treat them equally, is more important to God than you bringing a bull in here to offer it to God. It is a sacrifice that we make to Almighty God. But you know, so many times we look around and this person's arguing and that person's arguing and there's this going on and there's that going on and there's not righteousness and justice involved in it. There are personal feelings that are involved in it. And he says, you be righteous. And you be just in your dealings with other people. One of the things we really need to keep in mind, and I've got to do it probably as much if not more than you do, because you are better people than I am. I am no better than the worst person that is living on the face of this earth. I am simply a sinner saved by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I look at other people, I don't need to look at them as an enemy. I don't need to look at them as an antagonist. I need to look at them as someone that God loved so much that Jesus died for them. It's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? But it is a necessary thing to do. And you know what? If I look at them that way, I've got to let go of what's gone on in the past. I've got to let it go. Well, I know only God has the ability to completely forget because God chooses to forget. We've got to choose to not hold it against anyone in the past. So wives, go on and forgive your husbands and let it go. Husbands do the same thing. And parents do the same thing. It's hard. Sometimes, 
but we've got to do it. Not only does he say to do righteous and justice, but he says in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6 that he desires mercy and not sacrifice. And that goes along with the righteous and justice that we grant mercy to other people. Other people are mean, other people are hard, other people are hurtful, but I have to be merciful to them, forgiving of them, and let it go. Mercy, not resentment, but mercy toward those people. And then in Psalm 51, 17, he says that God desires a broken spirit and a contrite heart. That I not be proud, that I not be built up, Oh, so many times in churches we see people, well, it's got to be my way. I know this better than anybody else. It's got to be my way. And you know what we're doing most of the time? We're not ever looking for God's way. We're not ever looking. In my mailbox in the office this morning was a letter. From Steve Hill. Those of you that have been here a long time may remember that Steve Hill was a, an evangelist that came and did a revival here at the church. Steve Hill is the one that wanted to get into the schools. Everywhere he goes, schools let him go in for assemblies. And he talks to them, doesn't he? bring up the name God or Jesus, but he talks to them about success, he talks to them about their studies, he talks to them about everything else. The thing about it is, at the end of that assembly, you get to give out free tickets to a pizza party that night. And when they come to the pizza party, they're going to hear about Jesus. And they're going to hear about all the rest of it. And it's very successful. Except here, you, he, they won't let him into the schools. Skyline was the only school that would let him in. But they wouldn't do an assembly of the students, only those that were in study hall during that period got to come to it. So it wasn't very successful. But all the rest of the schools said, no, he can't come into the school. So, and he even sent him a thing of what he was going to talk about and would not deviate one word from what the manuscript was. But they wouldn't let him do it. But in that newsletter that he sends out about once a month or so, he is talking about Gideon. And that when God wanted Gideon to lead the armies of Israel against the Midianites, that when the angel of the Lord came to him, called him a mighty warrior. And he said, Gideon was anything but a mighty warrior. He was hiding. He was shy. He was not the one that anyone would think about leading the army of God. He said, but you know what? God did not see Gideon as he was, but saw Gideon as he would become. When we come before God with a humble heart and a broken spirit, and it's not about me any longer, God's got something he can work with. But when I come before God, oh Lord, look at me. I know this. I know that. I'm the one, Lord, that you need to accomplish this thing. God doesn't have anything he can work with other than an arrogant pile of bones. God desires a broken spirit a contrite heart, 
as we come before him. I'm nothing, but when God uses me and I get out of the way of God so that he can use me, then there is nothing that can stop what God wants to come about. When we think about Brown Road Baptist Church, if we're not prideful, if we're not the person, then God can use us. And God will bring about things that only God can be glorified for. But we've got to let him do it. There's one final thing about sacrifice. Hebrews 13, 15 says that God wants us to bring the sacrifice of praise. The sacrifice of praise. When I sing and I put myself into it, that I'm not looking up here on screen and seeing some words and I'm singing the words that I see on the screen. But when those words mean something to me and they start coming from my heart and I look at it and it's talking about me being forgiven and me being saved. It's talking about God giving us power. It's talking about a home in heaven. And I look at those things and I think about it. That's me. That's what God has done for me. I cannot just stand there and sing the words. I've got to praise God for what God has done. And I've started getting louder. And if you need earplugs, starting up here and working the way back, then so be it. But I'm going to praise my God. I'm going to look at the words, and I'm going to get happy, and maybe let it go sometimes. My leg has started moving now. It's just going up and down like that sometimes. Soon it'll be going like that. The problem comes in when it's going like that and the other one's going, then it becomes a dance. <laughs> the sacrifice of praise. That's what God wants. He wants a broken spirit, a contrite heart. He wants mercy. He wants righteousness and justice. And that, those are the sacrifices that we bring to God. So, the purpose of God's house is prayer, sacrifice, and evangelism. Because the, where they were at was the court of the Gentiles. And the Jews were to interact with the Gentiles and lead them to faith in God as the only God. What we do here in this church should make it much more conducive for a lost person to come in here and say, hey, there's a difference here. I can see it. I can feel it. Because I see people that are, excuse the expression, but this is a back home expression, that are happy about worshiping God. That they have experienced what they're telling me that I will experience. I'm afraid with so many cases, we tell people that God will forgive you, that He'll fill you with the Holy Spirit, you'll have joy overflowing, and they walk into church and they see a bunch of sticks in the mud. <laughs> they see no joy overflowing, they see no peace beyond understanding. 
they only see people that are maybe friendly, but there's no experiencing the joy of what God has done for us. I have experienced it in the past when churches are excited about what God has done for them, people start getting saved. When they're excited about what God's done for them, they start bringing their lost friends. They start bringing their lost families. And they more than likely have already accepted Jesus because you've witnessed to them. And there is movement that starts in the church. But there has to be a movement of the Holy Spirit among the people of the church, an awakening of the church to the experiential joy of the Lord Jesus Christ for that to start coming about. The purpose of the the Father's house, we need as a church to make sure that we do it the way God wants it to be done, the way He intends for it to be done. And we include prayer and sacrifice in the four areas that I talked to you about and evangelism in it. Now there are some people in here this morning that more than likely have never repented of your sins and invited Jesus to come into your life as your Lord and your Savior. Today is the opportunity for you to do that. If you will confess your sin, we've all sinned. You know that. You know you're a sinner. It's keeping you from God. But if you will confess that sin, repent of it, and invite Jesus to come into your life to be your Lord and your Savior, He will forgive you, and He will give you the gift of eternal life. Will you let Him do that today? There are probably several sitting in here, and you need to come. Maybe you have accepted Him but you've not followed him in believer's baptism, and you need to do that as a first step of obedience. You come today and make a commitment to do that. If you're not a member of Brown Road, but you believe this is where God is leading you to worship and serve him at, then you need to come. Or to come and pray for yourself or someone else, you come. Father, as we come to you this morning, We thank you so much for everything that you're doing. I pray, Lord God, that you will be honored and you will be glorified through everything. I pray, Father, that souls will be saved today. Decisions will be made for baptism, for church membership, rededication, or to come and pray for someone that needs to be prayed for, and that your will will be done in everything. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So as we stand and sing, just as I am, you come.